Angry Spork here, still taking issue with Batgirl Redemption Road. Ravager, a.k.a. Rose Wilson, Deathstroke's daughter, joins Mark and Batgirl's Patricide Club when they are beset by three other daughters of David Kane, set out to kill them. While Nightwing and Oracle argue over Oracle covering Batgirl's tracks on the Bat computer, Mark manages to snap the necks of two of the assassins, letting the third one go. Our trio follows her to a warehouse where even more assassins are training, and one assassin lies in wait behind them. Issue 4 sees the trio watching through a window as Batgirl quickly refreshes the story points and Deathstroke hooks the roof with a grapple. As Cassie laments how her sort of sisters would rather kill her than accept her aid, she detects Slade just before impact and dodges him. Mark and Ravager... no such luck. They're soon surrounded by Kane and Slade's intended army. Cassie narrating she could have ended up like any one of them, Rose squaring off against her father, and Mark is generally ready to rumble. While Rose seeks revenge on her father for those he has hurt, including her brother Joey, Batgirl tries to let her foes take each other out as much as possible, shown by one killer shooting her comrade in the leg by mistake. But Cass still feels guilty about it, and that seems to distract her enough to fall prey to a bolo. Careful, Cassie. Feeling guilty about everything is Spider-Man's deal. You don't want a lawsuit on your hands. Mark busies herself by slashing at her opponents, be it the neck or the shoulder. Wait, no, no, that's a neck shot too. When one girl restrains her with a chain, asking why she'd want to hurt their father when she and Batgirl are like them. The difference, Mark says, is that her eyes are open, and she presses backward, forcing the girl holding her to be run through by a sword wielder behind her. Ouch! Deathstroke takes to mind games by telling Rose that she's wearing a knockoff of his gear, and she joined a team he's frequently beaten and effectively built a dream home in his shadow. Not considering that such a home would be cool in the summertime, Ravager loses it and attacks only for Daddy Dearest to deflect, knocking her into some dumbbells. He says he kept thinking she'd return to him, but now believes it'd be best to simply kill her. An assassin readies a kind of spiky knuckle duster about to strike Batgirl and saying she never deserved Kane as a father. Using her glove fins to unbolo herself, B-Girl agrees, knocking her opponent out while saying that they all deserved better. Cass then turns her attention to Slade for some payback, knocking him into a rack of hand weights. Deathstroke notes that, much like his own daughter, there are only two ways to beat someone like Batgirl. From a distance, recalling the dart he used to poison her, earning a snarl from the crime fighter, or getting in her head and making her emotional. He's been in her head so long as it is, he can strike her jaw and gut with the ample assortment of hand weights. What's making that weird bong sound effect? If it's the weight, then it seems kind of rubbery and hollow. If it's Cassie's stomach, what's her diet like? After throat slashing another assassin, Mark grapples with one more with a knife of her own. To prove how dedicated she is to wiping every last trace of David Kane from the earth, Mark guides her foe's knife into her own gut, leaving the opponent surprised enough to fall to a fatal strike. You know, she enjoys killing too much. That Zack Snyder joke I made during issue 3 is becoming more plausible than I'm comfortable with. Cassandra, meanwhile, is wondering what facing her father will be like if Deathstroke can get into her head as she slams old One-Eye's face into the wall. The impact reveals the walls are lined with explosives, so I guess the cover was what they had left over. Slade decides the risk of total exposure is too great, and though one of the killer girls objects, he chooses the, shall we say, expeditious route for the sake of the bigger picture. Ravager, Batgirl, and Mark narrowly escape the explosion, taking refuge behind a car as the building crumbles. In the aftermath, they take in the awful sight, which Mark, of course, finds beautiful, since no one could have survived. Rose notes that her father's been through the whole destroyed building falling on him shtick before, and leaves to find him, despite objections, as she doesn't care about Kane. She remarks that Batgirl should be able to understand that kind of focus. Mark thinks the Titan was only slowing them down, and scars her arm further for the night's score. Eesh. I don't even want to know how she keeps scoring bowling. 
Batgirl chides her, saying this isn't a game or about scores, but Mark reminds that it is about getting even, i.e. settling the score, which isn't entirely inaccurate. Their mission is all about killing, even if it does center on one guy. She takes off on her own, promising to kill her former ally if she gets in her way. Cass is too injured to stop her, observed from a distance by an unmasked death stroke. He tells David Kane over communications about the trio's split, and that he at least has Batgirl to worry about, but Slade himself is out. Kane isn't pleased about the majority of his army being destroyed, especially since he told potential investors that they were to cripple the meta-hero community in two days to launch their assassin firm. A typical advertising stunt, but with slightly more bloodshed, I guess. As it is, there aren't enough girls to make that a certainty. Slade tells David that he should have supervised the relocation, and there was no choice but to use the explosives. If he wants to make good on his promises, he'll have to do it himself. Cassandra is seen in a dark corner, listening in through newly developed micro-mics that she's certain Batman would be upset by her using for her clandestine mission. There is a panel likely flashing back to a time when she did throw the devices, but there's little context as to when she did so. Bit of a hiccup there. They have a short range and are unable to trace, but instead of trying to follow Slade, she refocuses on her father, hitting a switch on her belt to fry the mics to avoid being found. Though, I imagine Slade will figure something's amiss when he detects the distinct aroma of burning electronics. Did someone just fart? Cyborg! Later in the Batcave, Cassandra bandages herself up expecting her father to carry out the impending assassination himself to secure investors for his murderous firm and rebuild his army later. The one remaining question is the target, someone whose death would affect all heroes. Batman's a possibility, as he's connected to just about everyone somehow. However, the possibilities are many, so she decides to think on it for a spell and looks at her cell phone, just like a teenager, am I right? The following splash page shows her back at the coffee shop, How You Been, and I swear I'm on to you, Edward Nigma. Her narration bounces between the possibility of someone being laid and not liking her to her father's plans. She remembers that Deathstroke said the death would affect all meta-heroes, and something about relocation, and oh, hey look, Watchmen reference, right behind her. She ponders calling again, but decides against it, not wanting to appear needy or desperate. Just as she's refocusing on who the target could be, Sal arrives, setting down his backpack, and glad that Cassandra called him. Since their last meeting, Sal had apparently returned to the shop about three times in hopes of seeing her again. Now who seems desperate? He asks about her bruises, and Cass waves them off as being from kickboxing. Because it's such a great way to relieve stress and anger, Sal mentions he used to be pretty angry as a kid. It all relates back to when he was six in Jakarta, and his dad was beaten to death at a political rally by government troops. It left him mute for seven years, but boxing and moving out of Indonesia helped him deal with the experience. Yeah, that's the way to win the girl over. First date, reveal the traumatic death of a parent. Second date, show off your collection of tattered sun hats you found at the dump. Sal admits it's not the best story to tell someone he barely knows. Shocker but feels like Cassandra would understand. She says she does, and that's when her phone chimes, so Sal goes to get a drink, promising happier conversations upon return. The call is from Oracle, saying she's sending Cassie the raw data of the blood sample given to her in issue two. There were enough similarities in the DNA that Barb thought the blood was Cassandra's, but then Cassie realizes it was actually Mark's. Before our heroine can process this news, she has a revelation whose death would cripple the metahero community, and what Slade meant by relocation. As Barbara tries to mention Nightwing's visit, Cass ends the call as Sal returns, and says she has to leave. He asks if he can help, or if it's something he'd understand. And Cassandra plants him with a kiss, thanking him and assuring she'll call, but she has to get going. To Platinum Flats. Cassie has determined that Oracle is the intended target. She feels she should have mentioned something when Barbara called, but she needs her to be bait for her father. And that questionable bit of ethics is where we're leaving off for now. So tune in next time to find out just how far Batgirl's willing to go for revenge, how Batman intends to stop her, and how many more digs can I take at Dan Didio?